Pan American Highway? Yes. We've been over what there is of it. But I'm not recommending anyone start down there tomorrow attempting to drive to Buenos Aires. There are too many miles through which the highway has not been built. And while I'm no prophet, I'll venture a small prediction it will be a long time before you can drive to South America. You see, Arnold and I have tried it, twice. We speak with some authority. The first time we tried, newspapers gave us big write-ups. Detroit expedition ready to blaze auto trail to Cape Horn, said one eight column headline. Across 14,000 miles of North and South America, through tremendous expanses of jungle and over high mountains, it said, is the ambitious undertaking of an expedition which will leave here tomorrow to attempt what no one has ever done. That reporter was good, believe me, he was. He said we'd succeed because we were big and strong and brave and courageous and because we were experienced explorers. Well, I admit we were big, but I don't want even to mention our courage. It was 98% not having any idea in the world what we were getting into. And as for that third item, Arnold and I had ridden pack horses for eight days once out in southern Utah, following a trail the Mormons had taken wagons over 60 years before we ever saw the place. If eight days on pack horses constitutes experienced exploration, then the reporter was right. Arnold and I were experienced explorers. Our reason for taking this Cape Horn trip was to get newspaper stories and motion picture film along the Pan American Highway route and to get material for a book. It was a self-imposed reporting assignment. But let me take you with us on this trip. It really is an experience. We will start here at Washington, D.C., cross the country and enter Mexico at Nogales, Arizona, continuing the West Coast route to the Mexican capital. The Pan American Highway is paved from Laredo, Texas here to Mexico City. But for adventure's sake, and to get well warmed up for the tremendous difficulties ahead, we'll leave the pavement to wiser and more cautious motorists, and we'll do it the hard way right from the beginning. Then from Mexico City, we travel south through Oaxaca, down to Guatemala, then through Central America to Costa Rica, and by boat around here, because there is absolutely no way to drive through southern Costa Rica, and then on down to the Panama Canal. That will be the end of this first half of our picture story. In film number two of this trip, entitled Rugged Road to Cape Horn, we will begin here. Take a boat down to Buenaventura, Colombia, then on up to Bogota, the capital, and south again through Quito, Ecuador, to Lima, Peru, and down to Arequipa. Then up over the Andes, 16,000 feet in the sky, and across Bolivia's desolate uplands, and down here to Buenos Aires. Then we will continue south through Patagonia's seemingly limitless pampa to Magellan Straits. And finally, as guests of the Chilean Navy, on out to Cape Horn in a storm. I promise you both education and adventure on this trip. High adventure. We will pull no punches. We give you here the realistic story of men trying to follow by automobile the route of what one day will be the greatest highway in the world, the Pan American from the United States to Magellan Straits and Cape Horn. Here we are then in Washington, D.C., where we drive up in front of the Pan American Union building to shake hands with Dr. L.S. Rowe, Director General of the Union, who wishes us good luck on our long journey. Before we reach Magellan Straits, we're going to need more good luck than Dr. Rowe or anyone else who hasn't actually been over the route could possibly imagine or wish for us. Arriving at the Mexican border town of Nogales, we present ourselves to customs authorities and are permitted to pass without opening a single bag or piece of equipment. This same courtesy is extended to us at every frontier to Magellan Straits, a record of friendliness, helpfulness, and cooperation from our Latin neighbor governments of which we're extremely proud. Our expedition outfit is composed of this Plymouth sedan with a special 35-gallon gas tank built into the trunk, back seat left out to make room for our mountainous pile of equipment, which is sandwiched clear to the ceiling, oversized wheels, and extra power in the transmission. The car, when fully loaded with gasoline, water, food, equipment, and the three of us, Arnold Whitaker, Kenneth Van Hee, and myself weighs 5,630 pounds, almost three tons for one motor to take to Cape Horn. The first day there is road all the way to Guaymas, but from there south for a thousand miles there is only a dry weather trail for high-wheeled carts, and we hit it after a six-day rain. Carefully at first we dodge every roadway rock the size of your fist, and ease into every hole for fear we might break a spring or harm the car. We ease into this hole and stay three hours. When we finally get out, 
we realize that babying the car can have no place on this expedition's calendar. That if it doesn't have what it takes to go to Cape Horn, we'd better find it out before we get too far away from home. So from here on, we dive into mud holes, skid into fences and stumps, boat through ruts on two wheels, and follow hour after hour along highway like this, coming out occasionally into the picturesque little villages which dot the west coast of Mexico. Usually there is a cobblestone road through the village and out to the edge of town. From there on, nothing. But up these cobblestones come the natives with their burros. This young fellow is so proud of his burrito, as the tiny beast is called in Spanish, so he brings it up to the car to have its picture taken. When the Pan American Highway system is finally completed, there will, of course, be a paved road up this west coast to connect with western United States. Then there will be bridges over these rivers. But just now, there are no bridges, and we get across them as best we can, sometimes by ferry, sometimes under our own power, and at other times with a good deal of help. This young fellow has followed along behind us for almost five miles. He kept yelling at us, No pueden pasar, señores, sin mulas, meaning we couldn't get across without the help of his mules. When we see how deep the stream is, we decide he's right and let him take our film and equipment across in his high-wheeled cart so it won't get wet. Then, with his mules hooked onto the front bumper and with Arnold on the inside revving up the motor to a tremendous roar, it's just all the combination can do to get up the sandy bank of the stream. In the Mexican capital, we call it Gobernacion to meet young, handsome, Don Licenciado Miguel Aleman, since become president of Mexico. He extends us every possible courtesy, and with letters from him, we are permitted to take pictures of anything we want that will help tell a more complete story of this great neighbor republic, of her ancient cultures, which are among the earliest in this hemisphere, pictures in the great national museum where tourist cameras are never permitted, pictures, some of which were the first ever taken in color, of Mexico's famous prehistoric gold and jewels. I'll show them to you in a moment. Believe me, we're grateful to Miguel Aleman. Here we are then in the National Museum and now looking at the great Aztec stone calendar, a masterpiece of early workmanship by a people of which we know little. By this great stone, two feet thick and 14 feet across, the months, days, weeks, and seasons of the year were recorded. It is perhaps the most famous single stone relic in the Western Hemisphere, and copies of it may be found on many leather goods coming out of Mexico. This is the amazingly carved sacrificial stone of Tizoc, historical Aztec war king, who put the torn hearts of his victims still pulsing and beating in that ground-out cup at the top. And now the golden jewels of which I spoke. Fashioned by unknown craftsmen centuries ago, they were uncovered in tomb seven of this ancient mountaintop city of Monte Alban. They are solid gold, 24 karat gold, and absolutely priceless as relics of the past. That we might obtain these pictures, Mexican authorities closed the museum for us at Oaxaca during the forenoon of two days, opened the sealed glass cases in which the jewels were kept, brought them out into the sunlight of the inner patio, and with soldier guards armed with rifles standing about me, I handled and worked over these beautiful objects. Jade pieces, brooches, pendants, earrings, necklaces, most of them depicting the different gods of these first Americans, delicately beautiful in detail of workmanship, symbolic of castes and culture among these people. Here is the Jaggernite breastplate, one of the most magnificent pieces of the entire collection. And this is the mask of the god of the flayed, representing the god who was supposed to receive the souls of people who were beaten to death for their sins and this headband, four inches wide and large enough for me to wear, with a 14-inch feather all of pure gold. No wonder we appreciated Mexico's courtesy in permitting us to photograph these priceless documents of her ancient past. Below Oaxaca, we now hit a stretch of geography that almost stalls the expedition. It takes us 25 days to cover 50 miles, two miles a day average, and we're plenty glad to make two miles. No wheel traffic of any kind ever traverses this section. It is simply a burrow trail over which the plodding feet of human beings may travel are the heavily laden feet of animals, and we try to take our car through it. The first three days we make nine miles, and I think spend more time on our hands and knees and on our stomachs than we do on our feet, trying to get the car safely over the sharp rocks and boulders. One false slip and the jagged rock might puncture the oil pan or the gas tank. 
that would finish us. We use the utmost effort and caution. If the big rocks can be moved, we lift or pry them out of the way. If they won't budge, we throw in loose rock to build around them and lift the car up over the top. It is torturous toil, hour after hour of back-breaking work to go two or three hundred yards. Those engineers in Mexico City who said we couldn't do it, Arnold pronounces bitterly, sure knew what they were talking about. Only we've got to do it. So we keep right on working. It is while following this mountain burro trail for 25 days that we have our first introduction to something which becomes a deep-set conviction to all tropic travelers, that the breathtaking color and beauty of tropic flowers are almost beyond ordinary words. We see them everywhere, cactus blooms, vine flowers, orchids, huge clumps of them growing on old trees or stumps, air plants, flowers so delicate in color and texture that you swear they should grow in a hothouse instead of just any old place out in the open. These lovely red bougainvillea can be seen in almost any open patio in Mexico, and I never can resist the temptation to get on the shady side and shoot up through the petals toward the sun to give myself this luminous transparency of color, which I think is so delightful. Here is a flower of a little different color and texture. This chap's older brother had captured this little anteater a day or two before we came along, and now the boy plays with it as your little son or brother would play with a pet kitten around the house. And I'm sure you've heard of the marching ants of the other Americas, haven't you? Well, here they are. We see them many times, wearing their own little highway two or three inches wide, sometimes through grass as high as your knees. I take a stick and draw a trench across their highway, causing a traffic jam. A hard-boiled cop could easily get his hands full here. We follow them for almost a quarter of a mile to see where they're getting the leaves, and finally find them running up and down the trunk of this rather peculiar tree. Some of the ants, with what seems almost human intelligence, are up in the tree, cutting off the leaves and dropping them down for other ants to carry off to their ant hill home. I warned you about the realism of this picture, so I needn't hesitate over this sequence. During the 25 days through these mountains, we have 16 Zapotecan Indians helping us. Their meager diet is tortillas, beans, and the broiled skin of pigs. One Sunday morning, after 18 days, they wake up and say they're hungry, that they're going hunting. We say, for what? They say, come along, senores, and you find out. So they take sticks and begin beating on hollow logs, and when they hear a sound, they reach in and pull out these long-tailed iguanas. But surely, senores, you're not going to eat them, I ask incredulously. Huh, amigo, they tell me. Seguramente, it is like you North Americans say chicken. Well, we North Americans will stick to chicken, is my retort. But they fall to work with gusto, cleaning the huge lizards in the preparation for the feast they're going to have, and do have. And now, don't these make you hungry? Our own eating is certainly nothing of a ceremony. We eat what we can get and with as little fuss and bother as possible. Usually, we try to carry canned goods from capital city to capital city, but we often run out as we do here in these mountains and have to live on native food. Here, we're reduced finally to our last few cans of cheap sardines and the tortillas which we're able to buy from the native women along the way. Doesn't this look delicious? Well, it is, anyhow. I didn't say a word there. Honest, I didn't. Arnold and Kenneth claim that tortillas taste to them like a cross between cement and leather without salt. But I ate them as a boy and like them. One thing, however, we unanimously agree is good. It is what the natives call panela. It is nothing in the world but the cooked juice of sugarcane, boiled until ready to solidify, then turned out into a wooden plate to cool and harden. And I do mean harden. Kenneth cuts off big chunks of it with his hunting knife. And we use it to sweeten our cocoa or post them, or as dessert, and sometimes we even allow ourselves the luxury of piecing on it between meals, because we find it nourishing and delicious and thoroughly ex What? Arnold suddenly puts his fingers to his mouth and scowls down, then puts his fingers back and finally says, why, Sully, it feels to me like I, like I, why I did, he snorts, I, I, I broke the doggone thing right off. And this is what we have to look at for two months because we haven't brought along a dentist. And this is his tooth and the piece of panela he broke it on. Believe me, this scene was not staged for the benefit of camera. And this seems to have been Arnold's day of misfortune. He was up on a boulder and slipped and fell. 
and as Kenneth puts on the iodine, he adds a little artwork to take away the pain. But Arnold doesn't seem to find anything humorous in the whole situation. He skinned himself up pretty badly, knees, shoulders, back, ribs, but it's just something we have to take and say as little about as possible. Now come our days of real difficulty. What we've gone through up to now seems almost child's play compared to this. We try to pull the car by block and tackle with bulls hooked onto the ropes. But the bulls won't pull with the motor because the roar of it frightens them. So we finally have to send them home and get more men. Then we begin to make better time. One day we go three-tenths of a mile, another six-tenths, another five-tenths, and one day we go only 25 yards. It's heartbreaking toil, but we're determined not to turn back. We run the car so hot at times we can't even stop the motor. We switch off the ignition, but the car keeps right on running as if we hadn't even touched it. We burn out the clutch plate from sliding it too much, trying to go a few feet or inches at a time. Arnold changes it and puts in our only replacement. From now on, we must carry the car if necessary, but there can be no more sliding of the clutch. We have minor accidents, of course, every day and there are plenty of times we'd be glad to call the whole thing off and go home if it weren't that so many people had looked at us with raised eyebrows and said we'd never see South America. This is one of the times I'd be glad to go home. Oh, I'm not hurt very badly. I swung a pick at a boulder and instead of hitting it struck myself in the shin. Just awkwardness, I guess. Certainly not much else. But I grit my teeth and daub in the rubbing alcohol and then proceed to smear my leg with iodine and tell myself how brave I am, you know. And certainly no medical school in the country would ever give me a diploma when it comes to bandage wrapping. But it keeps out the dirt, and that's all we need. In spite of everything we can do, the car each day is subjected to terrific punishment. We cave in one door until it won't open. We break three of the windows. We strip two gears from the transmission, low and reverse, so that all we have left is high and second. We try to keep the rear fender from tearing the tire to pieces and finally have to cut the thing off with a hacksaw. It's the first piece of the car we lose on our way to Cape Horn. But 10 days later, down in the jungle lowlands near the Guatemalan frontier, Arnold again begins grousing about the car. The thing pulls as if it didn't have any power, he tells me. Well, Arnold, it's only got two gears. What do you expect, I demand of him. I don't care. It doesn't pull as if it had any gears, he snarts and crawls underneath. When he begins muttering to himself and throwing things out, I get my camera. As he finally stands up, he says, no wonder the darn thing wouldn't pull. Look, it didn't even have an exhaust pipe. And the whole under part of the car looks just like this pipe and muffler, as if we'd turned it upside down and beaten it with picks and sledgehammers. We leave Mexico now after three torturous months, crossing her from north to south, and enter Guatemala through the customs house at Rio Suchiate. Immediately from here, we climb approximately 8,000 feet in one sustained climb from the jungle lowlands and fall over the crest of the mountains into this picturesque little valley where the Indian farms hang almost like plaques on a wall on the steep sides of the mountain. Guatemala is one of the most interesting and colorful countries in the Western Hemisphere. Her colorfully costumed Indians, her clean red and white villages, her high, almost perfectly shaped volcanoes, and her magnificently beautiful Lake Atitlan along with many other attractions, all make her a tourist paradise. No one who travels should miss Guatemala. During the war, she furnished us with great quantities of cinchona bark for quinine, jungle woods, rubber, minerals, and for many years she has shipped great quantities of bananas to your table and your neighbor's table next door. Now we find her friendly, interesting, and with an all-weather road from border to border, which seems like heaven after the three bad months we've just spent in Mexico. Also in Guatemala, of great interest to us, is found more ruined cities left to the silence and the jungle for centuries by more of those earliest Americans about whom we know so little. Here we visit Quiregua, remnant of an ancient city of the Mayas. These carved stone stela are all that remain of the city, and they stand here like gaunt old men leaning against green sunlight in a little jungle hallway kept in repair by the United Fruit Company in cooperation with the Guatemalan government. There is no agreement yet among Maya research scientists as to the origin of these people. Archaeologists, anthropologists, historians, and others still are trying to arrive at provable conclusions. 
Much Mayan history is undoubtedly carved into these shafts of stone if we could only read it. The whole Mayan calendar and many dates have been deciphered, but synchronizing them with the Christian dates and the calendar as we know it has not yet been accomplished. The oldest date yet recognized in these carvings is variously estimated by recognized scientists to be from 179 B.C. to 444 A.D. Still, no one knows. Some authorities see Hebrew features in the carved faces and believe the Mayans had Hebrew origin. Unmistakable Egyptian influence in architecture is noted by other students, and so it goes. Only this much is undeniable. These early Americans built cities whose populations numbered in the hundreds of thousands. They were a people of advanced culture and knowledge. Their calendar recordings of time, seasons, and some solar phenomena were more accurate even than our own. Their great temples and pyramids show a knowledge of building craftsmanship not humanly possible to uncivilized, ignorant, illiterate people. Yet for all this, from whence they came and to where they suddenly went, leaving their magnificent cities in ruins, is one of the great mysteries of America. From Guatemala, we enter El Salvador, smallest of the American republics, but in many respects among the most progressive. We're entranced by the beauty of the countryside as we drive along. These perfectly gorgeous flowers growing on big trees again, and the patchwork of small farms, the picturesque grass-roofed houses of the natives. And another thing that wins our hearts, paved highway. Imagine that after what we've just been through in Mexico. And Salvador's section of the Pan-American Highway is paved more than 75% of the way from border to border. We roll along that pavement now, entering San Salvador, capital of the Republic. And after a day or two visiting officials, we at last meet young, handsome Dr. Alfonso Rochak, one of the brilliant economists among our neighbors, dealing with the problems of the working classes. Under the doctor's genius and direction, the rural industries of El Salvador have been organized and supported with government money and credit, assuring considerable security and uniform prices to individuals and group workers in Salvador's many hand industries. Cloth weaving, hat weaving, pottery making, novelties production, and the like. All this work is bought at uniform prices from the workers and offered for sale in cooperative credit those stores so that the whole enterprise is profitable, self-supporting, and everyone can sell what he produces. Let's visit one of these industries now and see how the people do it. Hat weaving, for example. The big bundles of palm grass or straw are brought into market, and the women come and sort it over to buy what they need. Then back at home, they may work individually, or they may get together like this, a regular ladies' aid society, and talk and chatter between themselves as they work. Children weave as well as the grown-ups. They learn it from the time they sit on their mother's laps, although this youngster doesn't seem much interested in the process just now. Some of the hats are a bit ornate, but you see people wearing them everywhere in El Salvador. The deftness of the women's hands as they work, the concentration in their faces, all of it is extremely interesting to us. From El Salvador we enter Honduras, and now we begin to understand what Central American bull cart trails are going to be like. We were amply warned before we left Detroit about Honduras, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica. The State Department had instructed our embassies and legations that we were coming and to assist us in every possible way, within reason. Most of the ambassadors in their letters to us suggested pointedly that we stay home. All said, however, that we'd never complete the trip. No automobile had ever gotten through Honduras and Nicaragua, we were told. And now we begin to understand why. Dust. Choking clouds of it. Hills. Hills so steep and so cut with deep ruts that no car could possibly get up them without tremendous effort. Ruts. Those deep sidling ruts that only these high-wheeled carts could get through. And then another thing, unpleasant as it was along the trail, these huge hairy spiders or tarantulas, about the size of my hand. We see a great many of them. This one is pretty full of fight. And Kenneth finally kills it with a 22 rifle standing over my shoulder. While in Honduras, we decide to visit what is undoubtedly one of the finest agricultural schools in all the Americas, at Zamorano, about an hour and a half drive out of Tegucigalpa, the capital city. Here, in a lush, fertile valley, the school is maintained by the United Fruit Company in cooperation with the Honduran government. Young men from every country in Central America who have passed high tests in scholarship and adaptability are admitted. Board, lodging, and tuition are free, but standards of conduct, learning, and study are rigidly high. Few boys fail to make the grades, however, because they've been carefully selected to begin with. 
Here they learn the scientific methods of soil conservation, fertilization, cultivation, and production. They use the tools they'll have to use when they go home, hand tools, oxen-powered plows and harrows, not the machine-powered implements which they won't be able to afford when they graduate. It's a practical school doing a fine, creditable job in helping establish the agricultural economy of our neighbor republics. And while they're learning how to make their farms and gardens produce more, they're also learning that such places can be beautiful as well. I've never seen more lovely gardens and flowers, like this canna lily field, for instance, than right here at Escuela Agricola Panamericana in Honduras. And it's a real pleasure to be able to show such pictures to our people who have a tendency to underestimate our Latin American neighbors. On the way to Nicaragua, we now drive through miles of country covered by these scrubby peculiar trees in whose hollow limbs and trunks apparently live these long-tailed iguanas. The country seems literally alive with them. You see them waddling across the road, climbing trees, running down holes in the ground. They look awkward and slow till you try to approach, and then they suddenly dart away as if fired by jet propulsion. We try to come close enough to this fellow for a picture, and he runs for this tree, slipping from limb to limb with surprising agility. Even with a telephoto lens, I have trouble obtaining a decent shot. I do finally get one, however, when we meet a young man who has captured this fellow with a small rope and is taking it home for eating. We start teasing it by rubbing the spines along its back with a cane. It loses no time in fighting back, trying to strike us with its long, bony tail. As many hundreds of these things as I see, I never lose interest in them. Inside Nicaragua, the bad road and picturesque countryside continues. Friendly natives with big wheeled carts, pigs wearing pokes, one interesting scene after another. Time after time, we're forced up into the bush where we have to cut trees out of the way which blocks our progress. Once in a while, however, nature is kind and bends the tree in exactly the right spot. Along Lake Nicaragua, we try to follow the hard sand of the water's edge. But every quarter of a mile or so, volcanic ribs of rock come up out of the lake and stop us. This forces us across the wide ribbon of soft sand and up into the jungle so we can get around the rocks. The first day, we find ourselves stuck many times. After that, we finally learn the thing to do is to take half an hour and build ourselves a corduroy road, we call it, before we ever drive out onto the sand. So we hunt all the sticks we can find, limbs of trees, branches, poles, stumps, any kind of wood, and lay it across the ruts where we think the wheels of the car will come. When everything is finally in readiness, we give Arnold the high sign. Come on now, give her the gun, we yell at him. Come on, come on, and don't you dare let that thing stop. The car lurches, bangs, slides sideways, roaring like an airplane, and the sticks just fly. But if it rolls through without getting stuck, you can forgive us a bit of boyishness. When finally we enter Costa Rica, our first surprise is to see these trees of yellow golden flowers standing out above the jungles. Across the hills they appear like huge nuggets of gold in a gray-green setting. Up close they're as lovely and as delicate as any flowers we've seen. The bloom itself is ribbed and horn-shaped with a deep golden beauty. And then another bit of foolishness. We need it occasionally to relax. And if this isn't Beauty and the Beast, you think up a title for it. Across the southern section of Costa Rica, we find it utterly impossible to travel by car. Arnold and I take a plane over the mountains toward Panama for 45 minutes to check the trail, and it takes us five days to walk back. We estimate that it would take us four months with 150 men to get our car through, and then it's only a bare chance we'd succeed because the rains have started. So we give up and put our car aboard a banana launch and go down the coast to Panama. While we're guests of the fruit company, we decide to go out into the plantation to see what a banana split looks like in its natural habitat. You know, of course, that bananas grow upside down, so did we, but it still seems curious to see them hanging here that way. Now these fellows proceed to show us how the harvesting is done. The tree is cut about 15 feet above the ground with this long-handled knife while one fellow waits underneath to catch the stem of fruit on his shoulder. With a single knife jab, it is cut free of the tree. Then, off comes the flowering tail. Then, while the one chap carries the fruit off to the loading platform, the other takes a hefty swing or two with his machete 
cuts the tree down and lets it lie there where it falls to rot. In a short time, new stalks start out of the old stump and grow to be banana trees 20 to 30 feet high and produce another stem of fruit all in one season. In this one plantation, there are 26,000 acres of producing trees, furnishing some 6 million stems of fruit per year for American breakfast tables. You saw them spraying a moment ago, and we're told that they spray this 26,000 acres every 15 days throughout the year. So, since you might wonder if your fruit were poisoned if you saw a little blue spray on it, and it would not be because the spray is not poisonous, this procedure is followed with every stem of fruit coming off that huge plantation. First, it is dipped five times in this barrel of chemical solution to loosen whatever spray might remain on the fruit. Then, it is swung over and dipped eight times more in this barrel of fresh running water, which leaves it absolutely clean. The last time I was down here, I bought a whole stem of fruit the size of this one for 26 cents. Down on the dock at Golfito, this endless chain of men carry the stems of fruit from the padded railway cars over to the loading belt which takes them down into the hold of the ship, which will bring them to the United States. And so we finally reach the Panama Canal, the first automobile ever to cover so much of Mexico and Central America on the ground. It has been five months since we left home, and here we haven't even touched South America yet. But we will, for we're headed for Cape Horn. However, reaching the Panama Canal is a tremendous event for us, so we decide to celebrate it in proper fashion. With military permission and a U.S. Army major for escort, we drive out near Gamboa, and there, with the world-famous ditch as a backdrop, Kenneth goes down, dips up a can full of water, brings it back, and with boisterous shouts of laughter, we douse it over the car. As we brush the water from our clothes, we say more solemnly, when we reach Magellan Straits, we'll give it a real christening, but now the job is only half done. So we invite you to get film number two of this trip rugged road to Cape Horn, and continue with us for the last half of our hemisphere adventure and education, this automobile trip down the route of what one day will be the greatest highway in the world, from the United States to Magellan Straits and Cape Horn. The road to Cape Horn. It will be a long time before Arnold and I forget that one. You know Arnold, of course, if you've seen the first picture, Rough Road to Panama. It tells the first half of this story you will now see, an attempted automobile trip from Washington, D.C. to Cape Horn. Rough Road to Panama tells the story as far south as the Panama Canal. Now, in this picture, we begin there and continue the unforgettable trek down the Andes all the way to Cape Horn. To dramatize the route a little, here is approximately what it looks like in vertical measurements. Only even this is tame substitute for seeing it firsthand. These high peaks are not peaks of the mountains. They are altitudes of the actual passes over which you climb in your car, with plenty more canyon valleys and high ridges not shown in between. This map shows only the principal elevations. The geography of South America is perhaps the most dominating aspect of this part of the Western Hemisphere. In fact, it is difficult to imagine greater extremes of magnitude in any one continent of the world than are found here. Here we are then in front of the Customs House in Buenaventura. The car still carries the terrible scars it received in Mexico and Central America. But it's still going, so we're eagerly ready for the Andes. How little we know what climbing them in a car really means. But we'll find out. Don't you worry about that. We start immediately for Bogota, the capital back up in the interior and about 9,000 feet in the air. On the way, we cross valleys, climb ridges, drop into deep canyons, pass under waterfalls, and begin to understand why Colombia is so famous for her varieties of agricultural products, climate, temperatures, and vegetation. It's a surprising experience to drive from the torrid zone to the Arctic Circle and back to tropic jungles again all in a few hours. Yet that is exactly what you seem to do as you cross the three main ridges of the Andes which fan up from the south across Colombia, cutting her alternately into cold, cloud-shrouded heights and the broad, lush valleys through which flow her big rivers. Colombians are very proud of their country and her products. We learn that when they begin telling us about Colombia-grown coffee. They think it's the finest in the world, and some experts agree with them. 
but that's what the Brazilians and the Costa Ricans say about their coffee and the people in El Salvador. So we'll let these pictures represent them all and leave the argument as to which coffee is best to the experts who drink it and to those who grow it. On the tree, coffee looks like lovely red cherries, and that's exactly what it's called, coffee cherries. The tree grows best in deep shade at altitudes of 2,500 to 5,000 feet, and you see large acreages of it on sloping mountains and ridges as you drive along. After picking, the cherries are sent to the mill for hulling, processing, and drying. Each morning we were at the Alvarez Molino, we see the carts come in loaded with sacks. The cherries are then dumped into these small cars and later into the huge vats of the mill. After several different processes which take off the cherry hulls and other coverings of the real coffee bean, the beans themselves are spread out on great patios to dry in the sun. When that process is completed, they're sucked all the way back to the mill again through this six-inch suction pipe. Here, final cleaning is done to remove the bad beans, and the rest, full-bodied and full of flavor, are sacked for shipment to your table up here in the United States of America. Some of the more far-sighted of our Latin neighbor industrialists go to great lengths to provide high standard working conditions for their employees. Here, for example, the DeSola family have provided a fine day nursery for babies of women working in their coffee beneficio. The mothers bring their babies in in the mornings, pass them through a window to registered nurses, and go back across the street to work. Four hours later, they come back again to nurse the youngsters, then cross the street once more and continue work. And so it goes. This woman nurses not only her own baby, but also this one belonging to her friend who died when the child was born. Sunbath time is really a circus. And if you don't think these Indian youngsters are cute, you should be around them for a few minutes. This young senorita doesn't like Yankee cameramen in the least. She was much more content with Don Juan Jr., whom you just saw. But pretty soon she gives up, like all good children, and is back in bed along with the rest to sleep out the wait until mother's next appearance with something to eat. From Colombia, we finally enter Ecuador, and I think it fair to say we of the expedition probably would vote Ecuador as being the most interesting country through which we pass. Certainly, we want no argument with anyone who feels otherwise, because the question, obviously, is open to debate. But we're captivated with the country, and this scene is a typical reason why. We find these men making tile for the roofs of their houses and stop to photograph the process. When we explain we want to show our countrymen in North America how our neighbors in South America live, the faces of these men break into broad grins. And from then on, we have only to tell them what we want them to do. As you've already seen, they let the bulls mix the mud by driving them round and round the center state. When the mixture becomes sufficiently stiff and sticky, the fellows with a simple little frame and a big blob of the stuff proceed to make a tile. With the mud firmly packed in the frame, they next slide it off, very smooth indeed, onto this curved form. Then to be sure it won't crack as it dries in the sun, the one chap sprinkles the ground with water while the other waits to place the thing in drying position. When everything is ready, he looks up at me, asks if I'm ready, then quickly pulls the farm free and there is a tile. And here is the boy who drives the bulls to mix the mud. He says to me, but why do you want to take my picture, senor? I'm not so beautiful. Perhaps this scene, too, will help you understand why we like Ecuador. This cobblestone road is itself some 8,500 feet up, and look at the mountain peak behind it, thousands of feet higher. This is typical of the geography I mentioned. Right here, almost on the equator, are three peaks so high the snow on their summits never melts. And along the cobblestone roads at their feet, come an unforgettable caravan of people, as colorful and interesting as any people in the world. Some of the fellows carry more on the inside than they do on the out, like the chap over on the left. These costumes, brilliantly patterned and colored, knee-length ponchos in sharp reds and blues, huge skin hats, and the people themselves, coming along, leading, carrying, are driving their livestock home from market, an indispensable activity in the lives of these colorful Americans. Once you see them along these high upland roads of the Andes, you'll never forget them. The next thing of great interest to us in Ecuador is the equator, the realization that we're actually at the middle of the earth, the place where north and south begins. We pull to a stop, of course, and spend a whole hour here enjoying ourselves like boys. 
wondering why the earth doesn't look different on the north side than on the south, reading the inscription on the monument plaque, tracing out latitude zero, zero, and zero, which we probably should not do, but which apparently many other people have done before us, so we see no harm in it. Then, Arnold, always wanting to do things to remember, stands and grins with one foot on the north side of the earth and one on the south. And in back of him, you can easily see one of those great mountains of the equator, so high the snow on its summit never melts. And finally in Ecuador comes, I'm sure, the most memorable side trip of the expedition, a visit down into the Colorado Indian country of the Pacific Coast jungle. These people live, apparently, in family clans, with the father a sort of ruler over his children and in-laws. The fellow with the big stomach is a medicine man. For three days, his group has been in the throes of religious ritual, and he doesn't like the interruption of our arrival. How do you like these Don Juans and their haircut? We finally find another group not engaged in religious ceremony. With us is Andre Roosevelt. He said if we brought him along, he could entertain the Indians with sleight of hand tricks while we got pictures. So he entertains the Indians and I get the pictures. Here he shows them how to make a knot disappear from the tied corners of a handkerchief. It's a slick trick if you can do it. The knot is tied securely, checked, waved back and forth for hocus pocus, then checked again to be sure it's still there, but when the handkerchief is shaken, the knot has disappeared and the old man doesn't know where. How do you like this for facial concentration? And again, those haircuts. Their hair is as black as the ace of spades, but it's plastered tight to their heads, cut straight off across their eyes, then painted that dripping blood red which they use on their bodies. The men, as you see, use the accessory color black, while the women use only the diagonal stripes of red. Here, Roosevelt shows them how to make a coin disappear. And the old man doesn't understand how Yankees can make money go so fast. I'm sure you'd like to know, too, where they get the paint which they use on their bodies. It comes from the seeds of the clustered pods which grow on the achiote tree, wild, in the jungle. To get the seeds, the women go out, gather armloads of the pods, bring them in, and stack them in their grass houses. Then about twice a week, they shell seeds for the family paint job. And when they finally have enough on this palm frond down on the ground, everybody gathers around to paint himself up. Taking a handful of the seeds, they spit in it. Then with their fingers, they begin crushing the seeds, mixing them with the saliva, and then on it goes. They keep themselves painted year in, year out, 24 hours of every day. This is why they're called Colorados, for Colorado in Spanish means red in English, and these people are red. It's difficult to get the women to smile, but now the lady seems to have found something to smile at, and I guess you can hardly blame her. And right here, I think I'd better say nothing, except perhaps to admit my face is plenty red when these women get through. I'm not even sure it's all paint. You know it takes us three days to get that stuff off, and the last of it has to wear off. And so we head on south now toward Peru, with plenty to remember about Ecuador. But we're not through yet with memory, because on the way to Guayaquil, we pass majestic old Chimborazo, with his eternal poncho of snow draped about his broad head and shoulders. We'll have to remember him as a sort of exclamation point for all we've thought and said of Ecuador. Peru is something of a shock. Oh, we've been told of the great desert before, so we should be prepared. But after months of mountains and jungle to come almost without warning, so to speak, out onto a floor of sand where not a stick of vegetation exists needs almost to be described as shock. You see on the north coast of the Gulf of Guayaquil is dense jungle and heavy rainfall. And on the south coast, barely 50 miles away, is desert where it never rains. And this desert stretches for some 3,000 miles south along the coast. As we drive along now, we come every few hours off the desert and into wide fertile valleys where streams have started down out of the Andes, 75, 100, 150 miles away, and try to reach the Pacific through the sand. These valleys are all irrigated and constitute such a large total acreage, we are told, that agriculture is one of Peru's most important economies. Principal among the crops raised is sugar, and much of it finds its way into export. As with coffee, cacao, bananas, etc., sugar is raised in all the tropical Americas, 
so we represent them all with these sequences. There are many fine modern mills to be found along the way, yet a tremendous amount of sugar is produced by smaller independent operations. So picturesque and typical, we choose to show them instead of the larger, more mechanical operations. Here, for example, we see each morning this long line of bull carts heading out into the plantation where a small army of cutters is at work. They cut the cane, strip the leaves from it, whack it into four-foot lengths, and load it aboard their big wheeled carts where it is to be hauled back to the mill and crushed and the juice taken from it for the making of sugar. It is interesting as it can be to watch the fellows work. We follow them about, get in their way, joke with them so we can get the natural unposed shots we want. Take pictures of this operation and that. Close-ups of the men's faces as they work. Close-ups of the bulls to show how they pull by the yokes fastened to their horns. They have no harness as we know it. They pull simply by following the boy as he leads them, by laying his long driving stick across their yoke. Even the cart wheels intrigue us. These are solid four-inch slices of a great mahogany tree. And always the men are friendly, cooperative, if a bit shy at times, and get a great bang out of these visiting Yankees from Norte America who poke their cameras and their noses into everything. Finally, back at the mill, the carts are wheeled up to this dark pit where the cane is thrown down and fed through the crusher. Later, the pummy, which is what we used to call it when I was a boy in old Mexico, is spread out on the ground to dry. And when that is done, it is brought back to the shed again to be used as fuel underneath the huge baths in which the juice is boiled in the preliminary stages of making sugar. As the stuff boils, it refines, and the men, steam swirling all around them, dip the waste from the top. When finally the sugar comes out of the centrifugal tanks inside the mill where I can't photograph it, the fellows carry it out in these big wooden boxes and dump it on this piled platform where they dry it in the sun. I watch them with their hoes, rakes, shovels, and sometimes even their hands, and I finally ask the overseer if it's really good sugar. Huh, seguramente it's good sugar, he tells me with a big laugh. You taste it, senor, you find out. And so we all taste it, but especially Arnold. As we travel south now along the ocean, we come to a long ridge of sand about 400 feet high, so we stop to look it over. Arnold decides to climb it and begins zigzagging up across its face since it's much too steep to climb head on. While Kenneth, really acting like a 10-year-old, amuses himself by writing our names in sand down at the bottom. But Arnold gives up reaching the top and starts back down. I call to him and say, come on Arnold, run, show us some action, why don't you? He yells back that if I think he's going to break his neck for my camera, I can think again. So he tries to keep himself under control as he comes down. But it isn't easy, for the face of that sand is steep. When finally he plops into it alongside Kenneth, he says to me, If you're so brave and want somebody to run down, why don't you? To which I retort, Well, if you think I'm afraid, you're crazy. But I'm willing to admit now that Mr. Whitaker is not the man who is crazy. I go up as he did, zigzagging across the face of the ridge. And when finally I reach the top, I really put on the steam. I come over the crest of the thing at a hard run, and the instant I do, I know I've made a mistake. I can't stop. Arnold changes the camera to slow motion so you can see what's going on. But I assure you, there is no slow motion going on inside my brain. I'm frightened to death. The speed of my run and the steepness of the sand make it impossible for me to control myself. I try time and again to stop, throwing myself at the sand. But instead of stopping, I roll over and over like something propelled sideways from a gun, come to my feet again with my tie flying and my clothes up around my neck choking me, and I lunge right on down the cliff. When finally I reach the bottom all in one piece, I'm a much humbler and a much wiser man. I finally pick myself up and start over toward the camera. Arnold calls out, how do you feel, brave boy? To which I reply, brother, I feel terrible. And he replies, well, brother, you certainly do look terrible. I'm no Colorado Indian, but what hair I've got is full of sand. And I do mean sand. And incidentally, the hair of my head is not all either. If I live to be 150 and do that many more expeditions, I promise you I shall never relax in this boyish fashion again. 
We followed the ocean all afternoon after that, hanging on the sides of the sand and rock-filled cliffs with the blue sea and the white breakers beneath us. I still can't quite recover from the effects of the sand hill, so I coax Arnold and Kenneth to stop early so we can sort of rest up. About four o'clock, we pull into this little sheltered spot between the rocks and pitch camp. We've done it like this a hundred times before, of course, unloading our equipment, setting up the beds, Arnold fussing with the car and the drop light, and Kenneth lighting the gasoline stove and beginning the evening meal. I told you in the first picture that we pull no punches in these two films. We do not purposely make ourselves look ridiculous, as I just did back at that sand hill, or even as I do here now, blowing up my air mattress. But what we do is what you might do under similar circumstances. So this is just by way of warning you a little. Our whiskered faces, our dirty clothes and hands, our methods of relaxation to relieve tension and get a new perspective on things so essential to our daily well-being. Our way of eating. Yes, and even the food we eat. Everything you see here is as real as the air you breathe, like the making of old 77, for example, as Kenneth calls this stew. It's a specialty of his developed up in Mexico, where one night he surprised us by putting a huge panful of it in the center of the table, saying, no use washing a lot of dishes every meal. It takes too much time and water's too hard to get. Besides, all your food goes to the same place anyhow. So boys sit down and enjoy old 77. And this is it. Boiling water, noodles, onion if you can get it, peas, corn, and string beans for vegetables, then salmon or corned beef or both for the meat course. It's all here, and we guarantee it for nourishment. Next morning, we're on our way again, heading south through more desert country toward Atiquipa. Then suddenly we get a surprise. Almost as if we'd crossed a fence into an irrigated pasture, we enter a section where for perhaps half a mile or more, a thick carpet of flowers has spread itself over the sand. Delicate little flowers, looking like pansy-colored poppies. We can hardly believe our eyes. Then as suddenly as we entered it, we leave the flowered section and continue across the desolate country once more. It isn't until this happens several times that we learn that at certain seasons of the year, clouds drift in from the ocean through apparently fixed air channels and precipitate enough mist to allow the flowers to grow. Just one more of the fantastic extremes which seem so commonplace in South America. This great climb up from Arequipa is really something to behold as well as to experience. Up, up, up. Higher than we've ever been before in our lives on Earth. There seems to be no end to the climb or to the turns. 5,000, 8,000, 10,000, 12,000, 15,000 feet and still we keep climbing. Our motor loses so much power in the rarefied atmosphere we wonder if we'll ever reach the top. But it keeps going. The water in our radiator boils much sooner than down at sea level and we wonder if we've brought along enough for replacement and still we keep going up. Our ears begin to ring a bit and our heads feel funny with the slightest exercise. We know by now we're up in the air. Then finally, at a point more than a thousand feet higher than Pikes Peak in Colorado, we reach the pass and get out to look around. Walking is anything but brisk, but Arnold comes up to read the sign. Alto de Troya, cuatro mil seiscientos noventa metros sobre el nivel del mar. And in case you want the English of that, it means this pass is somewhere in the neighborhood of 15,500 feet above the level of the sea, almost three miles straight up. Still not satisfied, Arnold and Kenneth get out the altimeter, and sure enough, that needle points to 4,690 meters. Now we're satisfied, or rather we will be when we get down again. Entering Bolivia at last, we come almost immediately to the shores of Lake Titicaca, highest navigable water in the world. 13,770 feet in elevation, 130 miles long and 1,000 feet deep. Along the water's edge we see these large red-winged flamingos, as colorful and picturesque as the high country around them is drab and desolate. And then we hit the mud. A good thousand miles of it, from Comodoro Rivadavia all the way to Magellan Straits. Normally in the winter time this country is frozen solid, but this winter, July and August, it has just rained. For five weeks, we are told, every day, drizzle, drizzle, drizzle. This automobile met us at Mendoza and is to continue with us as a help and a guide all the way to Magellan Straits. And what a help it is. Six times in one day, we back up to pull it once again up onto the road, 
or out of the deep ruts in which it has stalled. I think that at no time on the entire trip have we been so discouraged and disheartened as we are here. I hope this scene begins to make you feel a little uncomfortable just for the sake of realism. With that fender off the car, we're blanketed with mud. It's impossible to keep it off. Day after incredible day, it's the same. Slip, slide, dig, and worry our way southward. Our clothes are damp and soggy with the constant drizzle. Our feet are soaked and freezing wet from wading in the mud and water. The weather isn't cold enough to freeze, just cold enough and wet enough to give us double pneumonia, and we all begin to feel as if we're contracting it. If we could just see the sun, it would help. But day after day goes by and it's just clouds and rain. We feel as if we're breathing cloud instead of air, and that adds to our discouragement and misery. But we're determined not to turn back. We've now come more than 15,000 miles, so we're not going to let a little mud stop us short of our goal. Then one morning the sun does come out for a few minutes and Arnold's irrepressible spirits rise with the light. I'll be doggone if I'm going to drive a car I can't see out of, he grouses, and gets out and begins raking the mud off the back window. It's a good two inches thick. Then he gets back in, shakes his feet, closes the door, starts the car, and heads on south toward Magellan Straits, south and still farther south. And so at last we reach Magellan Straits, and the central plaza of the city of Magallanes, where the townspeople give us a rousing welcome. We christen our car out on the end of the pier, fulfilling that pledge we made at the Panama Canal. And then, as guests of the Chilean Navy, on the little 125-foot ship Galvarino, we head south down through remarkably beautiful Beagle Channel, toward Land's End and Cape Horn, our only remaining pledge still to be realized. We're gone eight days. And during that time, we are treated to a panorama of majesty and magnificence, the like of which must be unsurpassed anywhere in the world. Maybe that's an overstatement, but I find it hard to believe. For these cold mountains, the deep purple-blue channels, the high winds beating the seas and rock with ice and snow, the sudden bursts of sun, storm, or wind, all in a few minutes, all seem to me impossible of being surpassed. Then without warning, on August the 19th, we come steaming out from behind Hall Island. Kenneth is down on deck. He lets out a yell. Look, he exclaims, Cape Horn, we're here. I ask the captain and we nod, si, senor. Then we know we're really looking at Cape Horn, that famous rock toward which we've been struggling for more than nine months and 16,000 miles. We begin slapping each other on the back in celebration when suddenly we discover the honeymoon is over. Within five minutes, and I do mean five minutes, a storm blows up out of the southwest which turns that whole ocean into an angry sea of winds, sheets of water, and deep valleys of churning mill races. For over an hour the storm rages. The air is full of harsh sounds, the roar of the winds, the mountains of water breaking over the deck, the clanking of chains, the groaning of the boat, the shouts of the crew, and, I guess, the groaning inside of me. I'm no sailor, I admit it, but I have plenty of company today. Arnold, Kenneth, the first mate, three of the five dogs aboard, and several members of the crew. It's a characteristic Cape Horn storm put on, accommodatingly enough, it seems, that we might have a fitting climax for our story, a climax in some of the worst water in the world. Finally, as the storm lets up a little, we round the southern tip of the horn. We coax the captain down on deck with us, and though we're still plenty wobbly, and the waves are still plenty bad for us, we shake hands around, and then, as a token of final victory, we throw our arms in the air and yell, Hooray! Hooray! We made Cape Horn! <laughs>